So you have to understand you're loved. You have to understand you're forgiven. You have to understand the blood of Jesus was enough. You have to understand it's a finished work and you're now his son or daughter. And he loves to love you and loves to live in you and loves to manifest through you. You get it? You gotta get that in your heart and understand through communion and relationship with him or you'll get out there and talk yourself out of those possibilities. And they're all right here on the planet right now. It's really fun. We've seen a lot, a lot of cool stuff. It wasn't just but a couple weeks ago I saw a man walking down the street with a broken foot. And I slid over to him. I said, man, buddy, what did you do? And it was just fun because I set him up. I, I set him up. I didn't. I just said, what did you do, man? I said, that thing looks hurt. And he had this big cushion on the cast and he had crutches. He said, oh, man, I really broke the foot. He said, the whole side. And I said, get out. I said, what would you do? And he told me it was some kind of fall and it stressed and snapped. And I said, in a lot of pain. He said, oh, yeah. I said, listen, man. I said, I know you might be in a hurry, but you ain't getting anywhere real fast. I said, do you need to be somewhere? He said, no, no, I'm just heading down the street. Why? I said, man, you're going to love this. It, 30 seconds, 20 seconds, you'll love this. I'm not going to hurt you. I just knelt down. I just knelt down like that, right? And just put my hands on his feet, on his cast, real gently. Father, I thank you for your amazing love for this man. Now, you think that might violate somebody or their privacy or their person. I've had one person in my life, a lady, jerk her hand out of my hand when I started praying. And said, you didn't say you were going to pray. I don't want you to pray for me. I had one person ever do that. Just one. I said, oh, I'm sorry. Ma'am, I just, you know, well, no thank you, no thank you. I said, listen, Jesus really loves you. There's help for you in the Lord. And I followed her a little. And No thank you, sir. I said, okay, but no, he loves you. And I'm actually going to believe that that changes and you'll know his amazing love. You never get thrown by where people aren't. And you don't let what they don't see affect what you do see. Because love is an amazing dominating thing. It's amazing. Love is amazing. I've seen people get healed. <laughs> They're mad. They're facetious. They're cynical. Arms crossed. Well, I don't believe in God. Well, I don't even believe in healing. Leave me alone. That's okay, not even asking you to. Just hold still. We're going to pray. Well, I really don't believe. I told you I don't believe in you. It's okay, not asking you to. Just Let's just pray. Father, right now, you pray and God will come and heal them. And they're like... And it shows that it's not about them. It's about what you believe in God toward them. It really proves it. It, it really shows that unbelief can't stop the power of God unless it gets in the... One representing the kingdom, the believer. If you embrace a belief that says, well, they're not on page, God's not going to move. Well, they don't have faith, so God can't heal. You come up with all that stuff that we've taught in the church, then you're not going to represent Jesus' life because Jesus is in the face of unbelief all the time. All the time. And John 12, it says, He did so many mighty things among them, them and they still didn't believe. Now, if they didn't believe after he did all those mighty things, they sure didn't believe before. But yet he did all the mighty things in the face of their unbelief. And even after he did them, they still didn't believe, but he still did them. Why? Because love dominates. A believer is the majority. One believer in Christ is the majority, I promise. <laughs> and he still manifested the kingdom, even though they were trying to figure out who he was. And people were still healed everywhere he went. And they didn't even know who he was. The Bible says he came to his own and they knew him not. So they didn't even know who he was and he still moved in that kind of power. Why? Because it was love. He saw who they were sheep without a shepherd. He was the Word made flesh. And he knew the truth about them and knew their value and their purpose to God. And he healed everywhere he went. And we've made up so many reasons why people aren't healed that it makes it hard for us sometimes to step in and just believe. We write books in the church, 30 Reasons Why Men Aren't Healed. I actually, and, and, and I don't know who writes those books. I've just heard of those titles before. And there's some kind of validity to a degree in it, but if you, but you know, in your personal life, but if you embrace that as the minister to the sick, those 30 reasons, you don't need a reason why it's not going to happen. You need to grow in the reason it's going to happen. You don't need a reason why it might not happen because if you embrace that into your belief system, it'll stop your personal revelation of Christ in you. And you'll cut it short of its potential. Look, Jesus didn't walk around and decide. He didn't look at the widow's son in the casket 
and stop and hook up to a reason why it might not work. He didn't stand there and and have any book in his back pocket to see why maybe the leper wouldn't be healed. All who called on him and came to him were healed, and all that he went to were healed. And a lot of them were in fear, and a lot of them were in condemnation. A lot of them were, well, they were under the law of sin and death. So Jesus didn't have the manual in his pocket, so I'm saying, why do we? The only reason we do is because it explains in common knowledge, in human reasoning, some of our experiences, but it's at the cost of truth. And truth is what makes us free. So I don't need to explain away truth. I need to pursue truth till I grow up and into it, until his experience becomes mine. So if I pray for somebody with cancer and they die, God forbid I come up with an analogy that protects me at the cost of truth or keeps me from growing into him more. Because the truth is this, it always boils down to this. If Jesus was in the room and touched him, what would happen? And who did he ever touch and they didn't get healed in the first place? And could you imagine Jesus touching somebody and saying, man, if you had more faith, this could have happened. These signs follow those that. So who's the believer in the equation? The one that's coming in the name of the Lord representing the kingdom. Even if they're a Christian, guys, don't put an expectation on them that cancels your ability to believe. Don't make it about them. Well, you need to do this. Well, you ought to, well if you do this, you can be healed. There's a place for all of us to grow. And you're going to see it right here in the Word. So I'm just stirring you up in that. Be encouraged. If I pray for somebody that has cancer and they die, I don't like that. That, that, that makes me cry. I get along with God because I know there's a place to touch Him and cancer bow to who He is. And I've touched a few and I've had some, some friends and people close to my life that sometimes it's too close. You're just so sentimental and you're just so afraid they're going to die and you just don't want them to die and you find yourself praying all the right stuff and it seems bold and you're really desperate. And it's not even faith working through love. It's actually need driving fear and all kinds of stuff. Sometimes the sweetest person in the church gets a terrible diagnosis and we're all praying with all our heart. It's just because she's so sweet and we can't imagine her dying and we know it's not the will of God and we have enough knowledge in Scripture to show why she can be healed and then we turn it all into a method because we're so sentimental and empathetic and we're just, oh, we think that's faith. Well, the Bible reveals it's faith when the mountain moves. <laughs> so I'm just going to be humble and accept the word. You can get mad at that. I'm not saying that to you personally. You can get mad at that if you choose to, but the Bible says that faith says to the mountain, move, and it moves. So the evidence of faith is what? Speaking to the mountain or the mountain moving? So the evidence of Bible faith is the mountain moving. So if it's not moving, there's a place where I am not connecting through revelation to the finished work that makes them free. And my mind's spinning on me. And I'm either turning into a method, I'm either desperate, uh, it's in my head, my heart's crying out, but my head's going, and you look with your eyes, you see with your mind, especially you pray three, four times for somebody, and they get worse, they get sicker, they lose weight, and then your eyes can't help but to see that, and it forces your prayer into a desperate realm, and all of a sudden you're praying with all this aggression, but it's because you're desperate, because you see they're not getting any better. And you can step out of a place of authority and power and turn this into a method that we're applying to get results. This is not a method. This is not synonymous. The Word of God is not synonymous to abracadabra. We're not trying to find a rabbit in a hat. We're growing up into Him in all things, coming to a revelation of love so that love is, 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 is spontaneously producing faith that releases the kingdom. To where you look at a situation and you see the person's value. You see God's love for them and the finished work of Christ and God's Son that came because of their worth to God and the finished work of redemption through His Son. And you don't have to preach all that. You see that. And when you speak His name, it's not in vain. Versus reading your Bible and getting all these scriptures and all this teaching in your heart and then you know why it should be healed and you know why it's not the will of God and you know all that and you have the knowledge but knowledge puffeth up. All of a sudden your knowledge can take the, the place of knowing Him and you're just th- throwing all your Bible knowledge at the problem. Quoting all this scripture. The Bible doesn't even tell you to quote scripture over their situations. It says, say to the mountain, move. Cancer, you are exposed by the Word of God. You have no right. You are not this person's lot in life. 
I, I charge you in the authority of Jesus' name, get out of their body now. I'm not asking you. I've said this many times. It sounds arrogant to people that don't understand. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you, get out of their flesh in Jesus' name. And I've watched a whole lot of cancers back out and say, yes, sir, to Jesus. Because Christ in me is the only one that's given me the authority and the knowledge to say what I'm saying. I'm not doing it on my own. I've seen tumors disappear. I've watched a lot of cool stuff. I've called a few people's names and watched them come out of comas on life support with their mouths taped on feed tubes. And, and, and I remember David look at me in Jesus' name. He was out for weeks and weeks. Another man for six months. No response. And he's just in a vegetable state. And he just sits up. He's just awake. It just goes through you. You can't even describe the feeling. It's like... Because down in your heart, you know it's true. Down in your heart, you know it's possible. But stepping into that place where it's a revelation and, and where you see it. And I, I was in one situation where I'm talking to the family and it just got in me real big. What I was preaching just became mine. And I looked over and I called the person's name and they're lying there like this and they went... And I'm like, oh, yeah. It's just amazing. That person got up out of that situation. It was totally miraculous. Uh, remember, I was holding a two-year-old boy that had the most aggressive brain tumor that medical science can diagnose. They don't even give you months to live because you don't live that long. It's like once they diagnose it, you're alive for days and maybe weeks because it wraps around the brain stem. And grows so fast, you can almost see it glow. And it just chokes out the body. You tell me that's not a curse. So you've got to settle that that kind of stuff is a curse. It's not God. It's there to choke out life. Some of us are still trying to decide if God's somehow involved in that and sovereignly and in His wisdom and allowing. And you've got to get that language out of your theology or you'll never have faith. You're still trying to figure out who's behind it. Well, the fingerprint's clear. If it steals, kills, and destroys, it's a thief. If it gives life and gives life even more, it's the Son of the living God. That was Jesus' definition of job description. That's not my sermon. It's John 10.10. 10. The thief comes. And you know what the thief is actually revealed as? False teaching. Wrong teaching. We've called God the thief for generations. And we've allowed that teaching to try to give us some sense of peace in the loss that we've all suffered. That somehow God's involved, so it has to be okay. And yet we're not okay with that. And we let life go by and time go by, and now the list grows bigger and bigger. And we're hurting more and more, so we have to come up with more reasons to make ourselves feel better about what we don't feel good about. It's at the cost of truth. Truth's our best friend. Come on, I'm just talking plain on that one. So I don't involve God in that. There's a, there's a yes and amen answer, and it's through Christ. The Bible teaches that in Corinthians 2, chapter 1, that all the promises of God are yes and amen. They're not subject to His administrative discernment. He doesn't change. There's no turning or shifting of shadow. Hebrews 1 says, in the last days, God has spoken through His Son. So the Word of God is sure. Heaven and earth passing away, His Word remains forever. He's raised His Word, Psalms 138.2, above His name. I can't rightly even discern His name unless I see the honor of His name through His unchangeable, infallible, immutable Word. So if He said yes yesterday, He's saying yes today. True? No matter what my experience, I have the call to grow up into Him. No matter who I've lost. I remember losing a man... The last fellow that I lost, it was really painful. Well, the little baby, by the way, with the aggressive brain tumor, while I was holding the baby, God disintegrated it right now while I'm holding the baby in my arms. It's just fine. I was talking about being like a child, and I just knew the baby had terminal cancer. I didn't know where. And when I was holding the baby, I was caressing. He, he would come out, and I was talking about being like a child, and while I was talking about being like a child and receiving and, and stop talking ourselves out of God, that church I went to Sunday when you guys had to roll last week, a man came up and I preached. I poured out my heart and he's sitting there. And he said, now I'm really confused. And I said, what do you mean? I said, man. He said, well, I just, I don't know. I was listening to you preach and there was so much. And 
just poured out, and I just finally I shut down, and I'm just confused. But you have to understand, I'm very, very analytical. And I said, well, you know, I understand you're saying that. I don't know how good that is to a certain degree. So, boy, it's a gift from God. And I said, sir, being analytical to a degree, I can understand, but don't tell me you have a gift from God because God never gave you a gift to talk yourself out of Him and what He's saying. And I said, confusion's not even of God. Please don't call what's confusing you a gift from the Lord. And then I said something very straight and strong to him to challenge his spirit. I said, this thing you're calling a gift, you can find in Genesis 3, it came from the fall of man. God said one thing and the devil made it complicated. And most of your analytical definition in man came from that right there. God said, the day you eat the tree is the day you surely die, period. Oh, you're not going to die. Look, God just knows that, you know, the day you eat the tree, your eyes will open. You'll see the knowledge. Good evil. In fact, you'll be like God. It's not like you're going to die. And all of a sudden, you're reasoning and thinking. and oh, The day you eat the tree is the day you surely die. Satan comes and says something else. Watch this. These signs shall follow those that believe. They shall lay their hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover, period. Oh, but not everybody's going to be healed, brother. I mean, you need to find balance in this. I mean, not everybody's healed. The reality is, where does that come from? It's the same exact voice. And we call it wisdom. We call it balance. But I don't see it as Jesus' life that we're called to follow. You making sense of what I'm saying? It's very challenging, very sobering. It humbles the human heart and mind on purpose because we've been proud in our own right. We've let our wisdom rise above his life's expression because Jesus is the will of God revealed. And we use this to define God. Our experiences define God. What we've been through define God. That's all backwards. You don't pray for Bill and he lives and pray for Bob and he dies and say, well, it's obvious, brother. God heals some and doesn't heal all. Because that's not the life of Jesus. That's not what the Word teaches. There's a place for them to live. You don't just quickly off the cuff because it makes natural sense. Well, one died, one lived. God heals some, doesn't heal all. I guess he wanted him to live to fulfill greater purpose. And I guess God took him because and we come up with all this stuff and it is a way that seems right to a man. Come on, the way that seems right, but it doesn't produce life. So all of a sudden we're embracing this at the cost of revelation, and now we face more and more and more loss, and you tell me where the life is in all that loss of... Come on, I'm talking straight. <laughs> there ain't no corners to cut here. <laughs> I just like talking. See, I live by this stuff. And not everybody I'm praying for jumps up and goes, Hallelujah, Amen. So that means... I've humbled myself to what I believe is the word of the Lord so that I can grow into that revelation in a greater degree. So I prayed for a man once and died of cancer and it really just ate at me and I cried, oh God. And I had to do his funeral. The family asked if I'd do his funeral. It was very tough. Did his funeral knowing down in my heart there's even an authority to raise the dead and I'm doing his funeral. And I'm like, oh! He, and, and it got in my head a little. He, he was a Catholic fellow, never heard the gospel explained, came to church, cried, prayed for him. He's instantly healed. He went nine months and he cried later, said, you know, I don't think I pursued the Lord much. I kind of took it for granted, let life go by, whatever. You know, that was his thing. I had to get that out of my head because nine months went by and this, this cancer showed up in his body after nine months. And it seemed like the second time after nine months when it came back, it just started coming and it kept spreading. And we were praying and he's coming back to the services. We're praying and I just watched it take him out quick. And I was like, man, three days, two days after the funeral, man walked up to me, man, I really, I don't know if you have time for you. I really need your help. I, I was wanted you to pray with me and, and I was told that you do this and that. And he's talking about, you know, faith and understanding of the gospel. And can you help me? And I'm thinking, I'll do my best. It's Jesus. He's the Lord. And he tells me he has this cancer. It's the exact cancer I just did the funeral of. But if you don't make peace in your heart and you don't seek God 
and you don't get past that loss and continue to press in, you're in no way, you're still bruised when He asks you to pray. You're still shaking. You're still reeling. You're still introspecting. And when He said that to me, I looked at Him and I said, when I heard the cancer that He said, it was like, I said, you better believe. I'll pray for you. Yeah, we can help. And I attacked that thing like I had never prayed for it before, like all I've ever seen is it healed. And God came and smoked that cancer in that man's body. It was a revelation. It actually sprang out of the loss because I didn't create a doctrine to protect my soul. I challenged myself into a deeper place. Are you following what I'm saying? How else are we going to grow into Him? See, Jesus was the Word, so He didn't have that issue. We, we fell and got born again. And we all need renewed in the spirit of our mind. We need to change the way we think. Because the way we think has been an amazing detriment to our lives. We've all been taught through fear, worry, anxiety, love for our own lives, need, desperation. Come on, they, they have been our tutors. Our whole life, they are normal. And heaven doesn't even understand those attributes. See, we weren't created this way. We became this way when there was a fall. So the reason we're talking about going out on the streets and just a lifestyle love, let me get back on track here and, and just wrap this up. It's just, I don't know why this teaching just, man. See, you, the foundation I just laid, you have to settle in your heart if you're going to have confidence every day in your life. Or you're still trying to figure out the will of God. When you see somebody hurt, you already have settled the will of God. When, you, when, you're, when you're sitting on an airplane and the person beside you has a physical condition, you're not sitting there trying to determine if it's God's will, God's time, or if today's the day. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Give them the kingdom. <laughs> and it's a real simple thing. You believe it's a yes and amen gospel. And you say, excuse me, man, I see. What you do? Oh, it's carpal tunnel. Yeah. Oh, I gotta wear this all the time. Yeah, my fingers are real weak. No way. Can I see your hand for a second? Serious. Look, I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm not even gonna squeeze you. I just can see. Yeah, what are you gonna do though? Don't no, I'm not doing anything strange. You're gonna love this. That's what I say a lot. I say you're gonna love this. And I'll just take their hand real gentle or just let their hand rest in mine. I've done this kind of stuff a whole lot. Airplanes are fun. You're sitting there because then you got to ride with them for like who knows how far. And once you do that in the beginning and they're like, dude, you're kidding me. What did you just do? Well, now you got two hours to explain it. <laughs> it's just fun. It's the kingdom. It's Luke 10. Whatever city you're in, heal the sick there and tell them. Wow, you tell them after they're healed? After you pray for them, you don't tell them first. In Matthew 10, you go preach the gospel and heal the sick. But in Luke 10, whatever city you're in, he flips it. It's either or. I found in today's society, it's really cool to heal the sick. He heals through you. Don't struggle with that phrase, heal the sick. I understand we can't heal anybody. But he still tells you to go heal the sick. Why? Because he's trying to say we've become one and when you go, I go. So get over yourself and get into me and just go pray for the sick. That's what he's saying. He says, you go heal the sick. You could fight all day. Well, I can't heal anybody, God. Would you just go heal the sick? I can't heal any. Would you go heal the sick? What's he saying? I live in you. The kingdom's in you. When you touch, I touch. Come on, it's a big deal. So you, you're, you're confident you take their hand and all of a sudden the stiffness leaves, the weakness leaves, the tingling leaves or whatever. Now, you might say, yeah, but wonder if that's not my experience. Wonder if it doesn't leave. A lot of us, I've found the biggest reason we don't step out is because wonder if they don't get healed right now. That's one of the biggest concerns in people. Well, love never fails. And if you don't step out and pray, you're guaranteed nothing. If you don't turn faith into a hit, miss, win, or lose, or a switch that you turn off and on and re realize it's a lifestyle and it's an honor to get involved in their life and release the kingdom, you'll step out more. Because even if they say, no, it still feels the same. Serious, it, it, you don't have any change whatsoever. No, it's exactly the same. Well, listen, and then you begin to explain your heart in praying and why you're encouraged to pray. And you explain even what faith really is and trusting God really means. And for some people, it's an experience to hear all that. They're like, really? Wow, yeah. 
And, and you say, listen, would you give me the honor of just praying one more time? And let's just believe God changes that thing right now. And I'll pray and I'll discern the situation. If they're open and talking and they're like cool with it, I'll pray. If they'll let me, I'll pray several times. And I've seen things change after the third, fourth, fifth time. Why? I don't know, because I'm making a spiritual statement. I'm not fly by night. I'm not trying a method. I believe it's God's will to heal. It's not my works or my prayer. It's His finished work. So let's pray. So by me not just backing down and turning tail and getting mealy mouth, I'm not getting insecure. It just does something spiritually. There's an authority that all of a sudden builds. Next thing you know, that thing breaks and bows out. I've seen that a lot. But here's the deal. It's never about failure. It's about loving people. And remember, you're not praying for them for you. You're praying for them for them. So for you to feel bad needs challenged. Well, I really feel bad now. I prayed for them and nothing happened. Come on. I'm not being mean. Get over yourself. You're not praying for them for you. You're praying for them for them. Even if they get mad at you and reject you, you're not rejected because you're praying for them for them. If anything, your heart is sad they won't let you pray, but your heart's sad for them. You're not going, boy, I really feel dumb. I don't think I'm doing this anymore because that made me feel really insignificant and weird. Come on, your eyes are on who? You, and you have to re-evaluate the motive in which you're approaching people in. Some of us are doing it to be more encouraged. Some of us are doing it sometimes just to feel like God will use us. And that's a risky place because all of a sudden your identity is based on what you're doing in the Lord or for the Lord instead of who you've become because of Jesus. You follow me? Don't let your identity be in that kind of jeopardy. So you pray for Him and nothing changes. I've had this happen in public. Honestly, I don't like it. I want them healed right now. I want them healed now. But I have to understand that faith is not hit, miss, win, or lose. So I have to understand. It's a challenge for me every time. My buddy Todd, we're we're out there in public and something ain't moving. We're looking at each other, giving eyes, grunting. I'm praying because we want it now. And we'll we'll walk away and we'll weep. He'll cry. He's amazing. He'll we need more, dude. We just need more. I know, man. Just pray, God, thank you. But, but we're not taking it as a loss. We just want more immediately's and suddenly's in our life. We're not saying nothing's happened. What I always tell the people, I say, listen, I am so excited and honored you, you stood here and left us pray like this. Look, we didn't lose a thing. Don't see this face value. The Bible says if we lay our hands on the sick believing, they shall recover. Man, we're believing for an amazing turnaround. Even you get out of your car heading in for supper, you realize going up the steps, oh my goodness. I said, we've seen it so many times, sir. Really? Yeah, listen. No, you didn't do anything wrong. Because people say, well, then I must, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm the one. No, you're not big enough to stop God's love. His love will run you over. He loves you. And they'll be like, oh, okay, whatever that means. They don't even, but you just, you know, you're just derailing thoughts because people are real quick to show condemnation or I guess it's just me. Well, there must be something wrong with me then. Well, you understand, sir, this has been like this for five years. I mean, it's been a real bad break. As if it's too tough for God. That's what they're implying because the natural side of it. And you'll just kind of chuckle. Oh, I understand all that. Listen, he breathed into dirt and a man jumped up. <laughs> Probably not too threatened by your situation, friend. <laughs> he had this little pile of dirt in front of him and he went, and it stood up a man. The dirt, a man. Now, we say we believe that. I think in a lot of us it's become Bible. But it really happened. God formed man out of the dust and in a faith that works through love out of the vision he saw, his heart and his love for his son. He breathed in and what he saw came alive. One breath. Dirt turned into a human being. The medical science still can't figure out and even touch certain things because it's so intricate. And so amazing. Came out of one breath from our Papa. And you think He can't restore human life, heal, drive out cancer, and change the state of men? One breath. 
So wonder if you do step out and pray and He breathes. <laughs> if you think about it all day and fail to do it, you've already lost. But wonder if He does breathe. For most of the situations we're talking about, it's just... See, I'm a firm believer that God didn't take a deep inhale into the dirt. Even if He did, I'm way impressed. I believe love just breathed into that dirt and what He saw came alive. I don't know about you, but that's a big deal to me. You know when I got that revelation where it became alive to me? I was praying for a young girl whose jaw from TMJ got cemented shut and the calcium deposits were so great that her jaw turned into one solid bone. It was as if you epoxied her joint and it was all solid bone. And she had her growth plates in action. She was 14 and, and she's growing. And it was so much pressure, it popped this joint out. So it was as if she had a wired broken jaw and she talked through her teeth like that. And they were feeding her through a gap in her teeth with a pureed food on a rubber baby spoon. <laughs> and drinking broth through a straw and stuff. She's supposed to live like that for four years till her growth plates got to a certain place and she was 18 and then they were going to manually break her jaw and put an artificial joint and try to fix things. Not sure that she would be okay, but they were going to do what they know to do. And they can do amazing things. Medical science is incredible how advanced some things they can do are. It's pretty incredible. I'm ready to pray for her. Mom's behind her. And you know how we get. We're so emotional. And this is her daughter. And this is crunch time. We're going to pray now. And she just starts bawling. Mom's like most moms would. They're like, Ooh. And I'm like, oh, bless her heart. It's like everything's on the line. This is it. You know, that's how we think. This is it. And that's not even faith, guys. Faith is the position for your heart to believe what he accomplished and paid for and grow into that truth. It's not this is it. But still, she was just crying because she loves her baby. She knows she's in pain. She sees how she's suffering. And I start laughing like a hyena. It's so it's such a serious atmosphere. People were getting touched. And I get to this little girl. It was years ago. And, and, I, and, and I said, what's going on? And she's talking like this and talking to me. And, and, she's, and I'm like, oh, your heart just melts for this girl. It's 14 years old. I mean, put a couple years on you, girl, and lock your jaws. And that's what we're talking about. That would ah. And I'm like, oh, this just got to go. This can't. And all of a sudden, I'm ready to pray for her. And I'm pretty serious. And I'm about ready to pray. And I hear this thought. If God breathed into a pile of dirt and a human being stood to his feet, he can fix your jaw. And I just cracked out laughing. Like a hyena. I got silly. Because it, it, it was like, yeah. And it was revelation. I got silly. And mom's looking at me like, did I miss something? I looked at that girl. I said, you know what? I said, I just thought something amazing it had to be from the Lord. If God breathed into a pile of dirt and a human being stood to his feet, he can sure fix your jaw. And I was like silly about it. I was like, yeah. And she's like, so I took two fingers and said, Father, thank you. You're absolutely amazing. I don't even think I prayed for her jaw put my two fingers and made a comment like that and I felt her jaw under my fingers go just the bones just broke and she went and I filled with water I said God Almighty just broke your jaw and she went I said you know the good news he didn't break it to break it he's putting a joint in there why don't you just open your mouth she went it was totally fixed Completely, totally healed like it was never. And everybody went crazy, either crying, screaming, worshiping. And I'm like, yeah, this is Papa. Went down, prayed for other people. They went to a Saturday night church that held church Saturday night. So the following week, I was at my home church on Sunday. My pastor was out of town and I was speaking. And I'm up in the platform and I'm ministering and preaching. And I looked and I spotted the mom and daughter in our service like 45 minutes from their home. And they were in our service. And I went, I was right in the middle of preaching. And I went, hey! And they're like, <laughs> and I went, 
she went, I said, yes, come here. And everybody's like, what is he doing? <laughs> they came running up and they shared the testimony. And mom is crying. Watch the sense of humor of God. She goes to school, doesn't like the menu, gets the alternative. And there's one of those little, it's like a four inch corn on the cobby on there. Sitting there at school weeping, eating corn on the cob two days before eating pureed food on a baby spoon in the gospel. The gospel, the finished work of Jesus made her whole. Without the gospel, she's four years waiting, hoping the surgery works. With the gospel, you see what's wrong with me? The possibility of God's power. Changed the little girl's life. Her dad was a, a dental expert guy. And he said, you know, you guys are in a hope and a dream. And all this prayer and God stuff. And uh, he said, I don't even know how you can believe in all that. He said, I have to see to believe. And the wife was just crying how dad had said this. And then he has the knowledge of this whole thing being a dental guy and stuff and I don't know where he's at today with the Lord but he sure got to see so I can't testify on that because I'm out of touch with the family but it's pretty cool when his little girl comes from a service that he's thinking why are you guys putting all your hope in this miraculous it's easy to criticize when you don't understand it's the common thing man does he mocks and scoffs the book of where is it it's Titus James he mock and scoff at the things he doesn't Understand. That's called human pride. If you don't understand, why would you say a word? <laughs> so she goes home totally healed. Is that fun or what? So these little revelations are huge. They establish your belief system to where you're confident to take somebody's hand. You ladies can be so effective at this because you ladies, there's just something awesome about the connectivity of ladies. You're in a shopping mall. You're in a clothes aisle. You're in a grocery store. And you girls just talk. You girls, are just, you just hook up. Hey, hi. You don't even have to ever have known them. And it's like, come on, I've seen y'all. <laughs> it's just good. It's not a bad thing. I'm not making fun. But how easy would it be for you if you have that kind of compassion and that belief system and you're talking in the grocery store and, and the lady says, yeah, I was just glad to get out today. It's been a struggle the last two, three years. Who's ever been in a conversation, a random conversation, and within a minute or two, the person sharing the pain of their life? Who's ever noticed that? Immediately. Wow. You're kidding me. Is that what's been going on? Listen, I know we just met and... You just, you just offered that info. That's amazing you offered that. This, you're going to love this. Can I hold your hand for a second? What do you mean? What? Oh, it's okay. It's so safe. We're in the middle of the store. You're going to love it. Can I just see your hand? I want to hold your hand. And you pray for her. You might have the confidence to just say to her, listen, man, please, you just poured your heart out to me. There is so much help for you right now through the Lord. Would you give me the honor? And I do this a lot of times. I'll say it. Would you give me the honor of praying for you? Not in a sentimental gesture, not a, oh, I'm sorry, that's pray. I mean, God coming, changing your, taking away the pain, fixing that right now. I'm talking now. I was just in a restaurant, out of state, visiting family, and I said to a lady up at the counter, she came walking up, I said, hey girl, I was waiting to pay the bill, her and her husband. Hey, you guys come in here much? Yeah. Look, I just got this thing on the menu, man, they don't even make it back home. I'm from PA, it must be a, thing from out here oh yeah that's good you don't have that back home no I said but it was really good and, oh yeah we get that and it was a certain recipe and we're just talking I said look I noticed you walking up here you're really laboring and I said what is that she said, oh it's my foot something's wrong I got a condition in my foot and it is so flared today and I'm having a hard time getting around and I said get out I said listen I know you guys don't know me and I just told him real plain I said uh well, let me just be straight. I said, I'm a Christian man. They said, oh, we're Christian. I said, well, good. That's awesome. That doesn't always mean we're on page. So I didn't say much. I was like, cool. <laughs> but I said, listen, I said, all my life I thought being a Christian was going to church. But the Lord's been teaching me being a Christian is loving people because I am the church. 
And I would love the honor right here. I, I know we're in the foyer and I don't mean to make you uncomfortable, but this thing works the way I'm telling you. It'll be a good day for you. I'd love to pray for your foot right now. I won't even embarrass you. But I just hold your hand and pray. Not in a sentimental gesture, but believe in heaven comes, that God Almighty comes and takes that out of you. And her husband's kind of giggling and laughing, feels a little nervous now. And he's like, and I looked at him and said, would you be mind? That would, would that be okay? He said, it's totally up to her. And he put it on her. And she said, I think that would be fine. I pray for her. She checks her foot and goes, does one of them things. And oh my. Well, then we ended up paying and going out into the parking lot and talking more. More than being healed. This is what she said to me as a Christian. More, she said, more than being healed. That's what she said out of her mouth. More than being healed right now, what touches me so personally was your openness and willingness in the middle of that restaurant to be so natural and just come up to me and talk to me and just do what you did for me and show me that kind of care. That is really touching my heart. And I said, yeah, that's called love, honey. It's what I never understood before. But he's teaching me now. She said, oh, he's teaching you. And she's healed, but she's loved. So watch. wonder if the pain didn't go away. Guess what she still is? She's loved. Oh, guess where faith flows from? Love. Guess what we're rooted and grounded in? Love. Guess what never fails? <laughs> so our goal is loving people. We're not getting heady and caught up with, wonder if the pain doesn't leave. Well, if you fail to love them, you're sure the pain's not leaving. So how about stepping out and loving them and giving God the opportunity to touch them? Even if the pain doesn't leave, you release people in faith in public. Don't stumble with it. Say, listen, I'm so encouraged for you right now. I'm so excited. I realize you don't feel any different. And actually, I was. sometimes that surprises me. I'm so expecting something to change. But the... the a sign follows a believer. You lay your hands on the sick, they recover. And you talk about it and you, and you tell them, listen, I'm believing with all my heart. You're going to see change in this and you're going to know it's God and it's just the love of Jesus Christ. Bless you. Have an amazing day. You're so awesome to Him. Well, thank you. Sometimes, guys, when the pain hasn't left, it's not until then when you walk away that they realize there's no catch, no string attached, and your love is pure in their eyes. You get it? You're not trying to sell them anything. You're not trying to get them to pray your prayer. You're just loving them. And some people have never been touched unconditionally. There's a catch to everything nowadays, it seems. And all of a sudden, they're just like, wow. Okay? So don't get thrown by nothing. Don't get thrown by people's attitudes, especially the ones that, well, I don't believe in healing. Hey, that's cool. See, the old school evangelistic mind is thinking it's blasphemy and, and heresy when you say, well, look, I'm not asking you because we think we want every man to believe. Well, love will take them there. So water harvest. But my goal is not to get them to shake their head when I shake mine. My goal is to love them. So even if they don't believe, it doesn't stop a thing game is still on. Listen, well, let's just pray. I've heard Todd say this. Well, then you've got nothing to lose because if you don't believe, nothing's going to happen, right? So why don't you just give me your hand and let's see. <laughs> and he is not expecting nothing. I've watched it a lot and then people get that look because they're changed. I've seen it a whole lot. One kid had a, it's a very demonic t-shirt. Uh, I forget what it was. It had a cross upside down, some kind of demon face wrapped around it. It was just a very twisted sh shirt. And Todd prayed for the kid, and he's cursing, he's belligerent, and he's putting on a show for his friends. And Todd got a word of knowledge for him, and it stumbled the kid a little bit, but then pride took over. And he's like, ah. And he said, well, dude, put your money where your mouth is, man. Come on, you're being all loud with your friends and stuff, but how about letting me pray? And let's just see. Let's see what's real. And I've heard Todd say that. Let's see what's real. And I'm thinking, that's cool. That's Mount Carmel stuff right there. And, and you had to do that. You have to know. You're God, right? So he prays for the kid and he says, check it, man. Nope. Still the same, man. This hurts bad. Nope. See? He said, ha, maybe it's the t-shirt. And so he said to Todd, maybe the t-shirt's stopping this thing, huh? And he's being real cynical. And Todd said something rose up in him and he said, and they have it on video. He was on the streets with the cameras. He said, 
He said, your t-shirt's not big enough to stop God and neither are you. And he laid hands on him and prayed again and the kid's face changed and the Spirit of God came on him and he's like, what? What the beep? They were bleeping out on the video. Over and over. He's healed and he's cursing like crazy. Now God knew he was going to curse. And God's not like, I say, I say, I make fun, you know, Jesus at the right hand. He's not like grabbing his son's ears. <gasps> Don't you listen. You know, protecting his son's ears from the blasphemy. He's, he already knows what the guy's going to say and he heals him anyway. What's that? That's mercy. And then in time, you can say, listen, man, you were a million miles from believing. You were a million miles from a heart even towards God, a humility. And you were actually trashing the person of who he is openly. And he's still so humble, so loving, and so merciful, he would come and heal you. Nobody's ever loved you like that, son. You'll see people on the street in that attitude cry. I had a man being so obnoxious to me one time, and I think there was some racial issues there, and there was some hidden stuff there. And when I fell on my knees and started to cry and wrap my hands around his leg and prayed, and Jesus healed him, he broke and he cried and held me on the street. He was telling me to hit the road and get away from me and you don't even know me and get out of my face and he is treating me very mean and all I could feel was love for him. And I prayed and nothing happened. He got up and walked and my heart broke when I saw him laboring. And I said, hold still, man. And I got down on my knees and there was something about me sliding in on my knees, crying, praying for the man that was being harsh. Something broke in him. He looked and, and he saw love. He un, it, it humbled him. It broke him. And the Spirit of God took his leg from elementary school to almost 40 years old, took his leg and his femur bone that never healed right and he was walking real bad, totally healed him. He could walk completely normal. And he took a, and he took and he turned and he walked like this and he turned and there's people cheering and shouting. His friends were all on the porch. It's the city. There's people everywhere. There's six people there. They just keep popping out of the doorways. It's true. They were just all there. And they were cheering him on to let me pray and saying, can't you realize this man wants to help you? Why are you so mean? Why? He doesn't even know why he's so mean. He's just been through life and he doesn't even know what he's doing. Jesus said that, forgive him, Father. Why do you take that personal? You don't. You understand it's a reflection of his life and what he's been through. It's not a reflection of you. It's a reflection of his pain. So he needs all the more love, doesn't he? He doesn't need me saying, oh, hey, fine, buddy, hey. Oh, brother, God ain't touching him with the 10-foot pole. He won't, yeah. Come on. Are you kidding? God wants to touch him. You know, so when I slid in on my knees and prayed, that thing broke, whatever it was, and the leg got healed. And what a good time that was. Because I stood up and I'm still weeping and he's standing there in shock staring at me. It would have been a great video. I looked at him and I said, that's our Jesus, man. That's his amazing love for you. And I'm crying. He walked towards me and we just held each other right on the street. And the people are screaming and cheering. The lady in a chair, she's sitting there. She's in her mid-fifties. Sir? Yes, ma'am. Maybe you could help me. I said, what, honey? Arthritis is so bad in my shoulders that I really can't lift my arms anymore. I said, you're kidding me. That's the high as you can go. Yes. I said, oh, my goodness, guys, it's believe for her. Now I got everybody on page. God, people are like, praise the Lord. You know, Amen. A lot of them have Christian roots. But before you walked up, they're not even thinking Jesus. Now you pray for this lady and it's like a fairy tale. It's like a fantasy. It's like a handwritten thing, script. It's too good to be true. That's how the gospel is when it's acted out. It's, it hinges on fairy tale. You lay hands on her shoulder, command the arthritis, and, and, and when you're on the street praying and somebody says they have arthritis, they're going to let you pray. Remember, do not pray long or you'll start putting your confidence in your prayer. Your confidence is His finished work. It's His love for that lady. It's the humility of her heart seeing and saying, will you pray for me? Oh, that'll fly. You better believe I will, ma'am. Arthritis come out of these shoulders. Every infirmity and affliction leave her body now. Shoulders be loosed. And you work in Jesus' name just the way God created you. Check them, honey. First time. Check them, honey. What? Neighbors freaking out. Spanish girl. Their people were weeping. She's crying. I'm like preaching a little. It's Jesus. Spanish girl says, I think God is trying to send us a message today. I think we need to turn. From, from from doing bad things or evil or whatever she said and turn back to Him. 
Something like that she quoted, and I'm like, oh my goodness, that'll preach. Spanish girl spoke that out. I said, I think that's a good word. I said, you know, and Sharon, we all prayed together. And I headed on down the street. The old school evangelist says, you didn't even lead them to the Lord. What are you talking about? I gave them the Lord. Now they have to deal with that. Not a doctrine, not a prayer that they nodded their head to. A real live encounter with changed bodies. An undeniable experience that will turn their heart to the living God. (laughs) Holy Spirit is a whole lot bigger than me getting them to quote a prayer. I'm called to go in whatever city I'm in, heal the sick, and tell them why. That's all it tells me. You know the sinner's prayer is only about 100 years old anyway. You do know that, right? It was implemented in the early 1900s. The church thought it was a good idea to start making the goal to pray a prayer to go to heaven instead of conversion and transformation of life. So then for generations, the church has scarred the world with what Christianity is and they don't want it because it's hypocrisy and it's the same attitudes and reflections of people that don't go to church, but the only thing we have is Christian confessions. The only thing that separates us is what we say, not necessarily what we do. It's repulsive to the world. And then they have a right in their own mind to resist. It's happened. A lot of words without demonstration. A lot of people, when you approach them, think you're just trying to get them to be like you. We did an event in a park, and it was all open, free, set up things for the kids. We got there. It's a very busy park. And the township left us have the pavilion in the park for two days, three days. We went in there the first day, and there wasn't one soul in the park. We put signs up inviting everybody. They thought, this is just some church event where they're going to try to get my arm behind my back and get me to pray their prayer. They're going to give our kids free snowballs and free slides and free rides, free face painting, and try to win our hearts with all this free stuff at a cost. That's what they're thinking. Come on, we do it. We go to the race or the parade on a real hot day and we hand out our charity water so that we can have access to them and get them to pray our prayer. We're not giving them water because they're thirsty. We're giving them water as a tool to access their heart. It's a string to get to their heart. And they already know that. And sometimes they're thirsty and won't even take the water because they don't want to have to be confronted with your prayer. When do you give them water because they're thirsty? (laughs) We had to go around our neighborhood of that park and apologize for the way the church has represented itself and the gospel and that there's zero strings to this, guys. This is just for you. And the next day, the park was packed. Here's why. A bunch of words of knowledge at the doors of these people's houses. We were in an apartment complex and people were getting healed on the third floor and the first floor simultaneously, crying, flipping out. Scoliosis came out of a lady. All kinds of stuff was happening. And then people talk. Look, these people, they aren't weird. They're not pushing church. They came to They knew that so-and-so, oh my God. Next night, the park was packed. We didn't press nobody, push nobody. We were just in there loving and worship teams flowing and we're just mingling and talking and people were sharing things and we saw some sick and listen man, no pressure on you in this. It'd be an honor to pray for you. There ain't a string to this. I believe Jesus wants to heal you. People getting healed. The third night was our last night. The park was fuller yet. People brought their neighborhood friends to be prayed for on the third night. One mom brought her baby like 10, 11 blocks because she heard what God was doing and brought her sick baby hoping someone would pray. Somebody went down and got all the women from the shelter and brought them into the park so we could love them. Third night. First night it was a ghost town because they thought we were there to convert them. When they realized we were there to love them, nobody ran from love. In fact, on the third night they ran to it. Oh, I feel that. That's good. (laughs) Oh, it's so late. I'm messing up, Chuck. (gasps) 
Anybody have questions? No? I must be preaching good. That doesn't mean I'm not preaching good, does it? <laughs> no, what's up? <laughs> It's my personal belief, okay? It's, I'm just answering from my own personal heart. Uh, oh, why does it seem sometimes more binding, more difficult, not the same results, not free flowing when it's family, close, mom, dad, kids, whatever, than when you just touch people you've never met and seen? There's a situation in my own life, very close, my mother that I've never seen the situation in her life change. And it just grates on me. <sighs> but the more it grates on me, the more complicated it is. It's so close to home. I, I'm so aware of all the things that have transpired and said and done, and it all tries to find a place here. And Jesus is bringing me to a place where, even in my preaching, where I know in my heart, or at least in my head, that none of that matters, and somehow... It's like a stronghold tries to get there. It's, it's like it's so close to home. It's, it's been your experience so long or you've prayed so many times. that sometimes it feels like it's just another time and it becomes rhetorical and it becomes just words. I think the only thing we can do is back off and regroup and just get a fresh place in His love and look at that situation in a new light and not as the same old here we go again. With my own mother, it got so rough on my soul that I didn't even pray for her for about a year because I was so... I saw the disease that she's had for 35 years healed that summer two times right in front of me and ran to pray for her. <sighs> But you can tell I have love for my mom and I don't like that situation, but you can tell I honor the gospel. The lack of results with her doesn't change a thing about him. It actually inspires me to keep seeking because there's hope and promise. You follow me? Where I've seen the flip side more than not, where people take that so personal, so into their heart that it changes what this says because there's so many feelings and offenses to where all of a sudden God's redefined or dished on or, or we take, watch this. This is going to be convicting. You opened up this question. This will be good. <laughs> so we all got to love him for this question because it's going to be good. We take what is a gift like our children, our spouses, the people in our lives, they're gifts, they're blessings, they're from the Lord, they're, they're predestined by God. It's, it's this whole thing called our lives is God. And sometimes we get so sentimental that we take what is a gift and a blessing and covet it, it becomes even greater than our knowledge of God or our love for God. And all of a sudden what comes from God becomes greater than God at the cost of who He is. Oh, that's a sobering, challenging word. And all of a sudden, somebody has a child and something drastic happens. And now God is the problem. And they cut him off inside, forgetting that we're in a war and the earth he gave to the children of men and he's our only answer. And all things came from him in the first place. And he didn't give you a child to test you and wreck your heart. But a lot of times that way that seems right to man creeps in and it's all we can see and think and our friends and family don't help matters because maybe they don't carry a great revelation either and next thing you know everybody's just hurting and God takes the rap and He's the potter and we're just the clay and all of a sudden we've taken Him to court here and found Him guilty and He's the potter and we're the clay and what's that mean? That means we have just risen above God and become God. Whoa. Sounds like the fall of man all over again. God's unto ourself. And now we know at the cost of who He is. When who He is is our answer. It's a good, good protecting word. So, 
Can I read, should I wrap up or can I read John 20? What do you want me to do? Call the shots, man. I'm glad you said it. I really am just because I really want to read this. Do you understand what I did? I took all that time that I thought I was going to take to do this to lay a foundation so that we can just understand the will of God to touch people. Come on. We have to get past the pains, the unanswered prayers, and the lost loved ones and understand that there's a yes from heaven. Period. Or you won't have confidence to step out in situations. So when I go to pray for my good friend and he's dying of cancer, three other people dear to me start running into my mind and then I think, here we go again. This looks just like Karen. This looks just like Dylan. This looks just like Sam. And all of a sudden I'm praying from all the wrong places and I'm intimidated and I'm moved by everything but faith that works through love, even though I'm saying all the right things with emphatic emphasis. Does that make sense? I'm just being humble. I've been through that. I laid on my bed and cried when he died because I know he can live. I just know. And I'm like, God. And, and, and he spoke to me about the voice of the soul and, and, and how your resume of healings work for you, but some of your losses still try to speak and work against what you're doing. And how they were flashing to me. And here we go again and how I was falsely motivated. And what we see plays such with family sometimes. The, the visuals, things that are visuals, are very hard on us here. Because you're looking for it to change and while you're praying and not seeing it change, your mind's going on tilt. You pray for a paralytic and their legs are turned and thin and you're praying and you just prayed all you know to pray and they still look the same. Your mind's on tilt already. And you feel very uncomfortable. Where do I go from here? And what do I say? And you try to pray a more gracious prayer or a more powerful prayer. Or I don't know what we do, but we get in trouble here with visuals. We've got to grow beyond that stuff. I said to the Lord about that man passing and I laid on my bed and he said, what's the only leg you haven't seen grow? And at that time, there was another one I hadn't seen grow. If he ever hears this video, he's going to flip out if his leg didn't grow by now because he said, man, he said, now, he said, I heard that testimony about the leg and he said, now you're going to say, now there's one more and it's going to be me. And he was like having fun with me. And the Lord corrected me so heavy after I prayed for him. I was heading home. And I was talking to the Lord about this man. His leg was only that short. It was born that short. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of those things grow. I've never seen one not, actually, except for a 10-year-old boy with a 5-inch short leg. A 10-year-old boy with a 5-inch short leg looks like a mile to your eye. And somewhere in that process, we saw an adult in that same service with a 4-inch short leg grow. But the boy with the five, we prayed and prayed and prayed. Me and Todd both prayed and prayed and prayed and didn't see it change. It just grated on me. And the Lord showed me that the visual was beyond where my revelation was, that the visual was a stumbling block, that it was, it was such a dramatic visual. And I think that little baby I told you guys about, that's why I didn't get a teenager and I just chose to pray for the baby because I just want to keep growing. Because I just got to pray for a three-month-old baby who had a leg that looked almost half the size of the other leg. It was that much different. We had a three-year, three-month-old baby with a cute little, just normal leg, and the other leg, it looked like a comparison. I told these guys as if your index finger, or your middle finger and your pinky. It was that dramatic. And in my hands, while I was thanking God for His amazing love for her and her creative value, I wasn't even praying for the leg. Mom's holding her and she's ready to leave the service. And in my hands, while I'm talking about how much God loves her and thanking God for this amazing, precious baby, I look down and I'm watching her leg transform to match the other one. And I'm looking at Mom saying, you do see your baby's leg, don't you? And she went... (laughs) She was just... Uh, she was done. She couldn't even talk. She could hardly breathe. And I was just having one of those hyena times. <laughs> it was just fun. I wasn't even like, oh my God. I was just like, yeah. It was just one of those, you're just there. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just you're there. You see it. And that little baby's leg completely transformed. A month later, they brought her back to service with the brother who had spinal bifida, who they told to abort when he was in the womb. And they said, we can't. We're going to trust Jesus. He said, well, he'll never walk and he'll have so many complications. We'll trust the Lord. Now he's several years old. 
The daddy came up a month later. They shared about the little girl and her leg. And the doctor said everything's normal. He's holding the little boy. He's wrapped around daddy. He has never even tried to stand. So he's never stood and he's never walked. He's telling the testimony of how they left and went home. And how we all surrounded him and prayed. And how when they got back to their hotel and sat him down and looked at him and checked him. That I'll be honest, our hearts were... uh, a little bit disheartened and discouraged, but we remembered what we were told to face not a hit in this one. And there was a sharing. And he said, and then we went home and we got home and laid him in the living room where we usually do. And he said, he said, and you need to understand that we were just at home. It was a normal day. And then he's like, excuse me, he put his boy down, set him down while he's telling the testimony. And his little boy puts him down. His little boy's just standing there. And everybody starts freaking out, wailing and flipping out. And then he turns and he smiles and he sees me in the front row and he's blowing kisses. And then he walks to mom. Spinal bifida never stood, never walked. They took him home a day after we prayed. Sat him in the living room. A day after, you could let your mind go haywire. You could turn the gospel into a method. Or it can be a finished work. They sit him down. And out of the blue, he just stands to his feet and starts walking. Nobody taught him. Atrophy was going. He's never used his legs, guys. His legs would have had to have been atrophy and thin. And He's never walked. He's never stood. He just stands up and starts walking. Oops. <laughs> Dad runs in with the camera on the phone, the little video, and videos his boy walking miraculously by the Spirit of God on the phone. <laughs> See what's wrong with me? This kind of stuff. John 20, I keep saying I'm going there and I still don't go there. Let me skip and just go way down here. Oh, man, I can't. I, I'm just going to do my best to get through this quickly. Verse 17, I'll just bring you up to speed. Jesus just raised from the dead. They ran to the tomb and he's raised, okay? You guys on page? And she's thinking the gardener took him, right? Mary's like, where where'd you lay him? Show me, I'll get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, in verse 16, she's like, Rabuni, that means teacher. Now look what he said, don't cling to me. I've not yet ascended to my father. Go to my brother and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father. Hear the covenant term? Don't cling to me. He's not saying, don't defile me. Look, I'm pure and you're not. And I just raised from the dead. Don't cling to me. I've heard some people say some weird stuff about this. What he's saying is, don't detain me. My work's not yet finished. Don't cling to me. I haven't ascended to the Father. He hasn't gone into the holy place not made with hands. He hasn't ascended into the holy tabernacle and applied his own blood as high priest to man on the mercy seat. He hasn't done that yet. He just raised from the dead. Don't cling to me. This thing isn't totally wrapped yet. But just go... Go back to the disciples, back to my brethren. You hear the family term, covenant? Tell them I'm going to my father and your father, to my God and your God. He's saying we're one, guys. You got to catch that when you read your Bible and get really like flipped out about it. It's really good. It's not just, ah. And Mary came and told the disciples and, and that these things were spoken. Watch, the same day at evening, What day? At evening. This is amazing. Because we know in the other gospel, he was on the road to Emmaus. So after he left Mary, he must have appeared to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Who knows Jesus can do a lot of things at once. But there's a time frame here that needs understood. He's on the road to Emmaus, and at in the evening, at supper time, it's revealed to them that he's the Lord. And they wanted him to stay, and he's he disappeared. Where did he go? He went to the Father. You can tell. How can you tell he went to the Father? Because he told Mary that's where he was heading. He just stopped and poured into the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And then he went, whoop. And the same day at evening, he came back. Here's how you know he went to the Father with his blood. This is so amazing to me. That same day, first day of the week, when the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. So they were there because of fear. You see how their motive wasn't even, their motive was fear. And Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, look what he said, peace 
be with you. Why? We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been justified by faith through his blood. Watch. While he said this, he showed him his hands aside and the disciples saw that it was the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace to you. Now watch what he said. As the Father sent, as the Father sent me, I also send you. He sent him to be the living epistle of love, to model a life in right relationship with God with no sin barrier. Well, how much sin does the blood of Jesus cover and remove? All. So is there a sin barrier? No. That's why Jesus said, follow me. The things I do, you'll do if you believe. We don't realize how critical that is. We talk ourselves out of believing a lot. Well, that was Jesus. That's not as well. Are you saying you can do it? Yeah, he's saying that because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. He's firstborn among many, brethren. We're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. It's all there. <laughs> you say, well, he's talking to the disciples. No, he's talking to us too. No, he's talking to the disciples. Well, here he is. But in Matthew 28, he said, because you get the full commission picture, the full resurrection picture when you read all four gospels. You get the whole picture. In Matthew 28, he said, you go make disciples of all nations, teaching and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've taught you. So if he's talking to them, he's talking to me. Because he told them to teach us everything he taught them. So if he said, whatever city you're in, heal the sick there, he's telling us. If he told them, as the Father sent me, I send you, and they're making believers out of believers... And these signs follow believers. Sounds like we're all in the same boat. So don't dish it off on the disciples and exclude yourself when it's one in the same spirit. You get it? Peace be to you as the Father sent me, I send you. Now this is one of the most amazing things of what I'm showing you right here. So see, Jesus is a living epistle of love. Everywhere he went, people were healed. He said, as the Father sent me, I send you. Outreaches are great. Church organized touch in the cities are great, but they're even greater when they flow out of who you already are and what you're already doing. There were so many things Jesus did that if the, they were written one by one, the world wouldn't contain the books. So he had a pretty profuse life. And he said, follow me. So he's an open door of heaven. It's just heaven flowing, love flowing. It's a big deal. Now watch. Peace, he said twice, as the Father sent me, I send you. You can't find a limitation on that. As the Father, I also send you. And when he said this, guess what he did? This is so sweet to me. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This is how you know he just came from ascending to the Father and putting his blood on the mercy seat. Because watch, when God brought forth Adam in Genesis, he breathed on him and man became a living being. He ate the tree and died, spiritually disconnected from love and became self-centered and self-serving. You must be born again. Jesus is the second Adam or the last Adam and he's the breath of God, the second breath of God to man. He's the resurrection power. He's raised us from the dead. True? So Jesus comes back from the dead, puts his blood on the mercy seat, comes back down to earth to his disciples and replays Genesis and breathes back into man and man becomes a living being as if he never sinned. And once again, the life and spirit of God and the nature of God could live in man because of his blood. <gasps> Do you get it? Why did he breathe on them? Because he's starting over the way it was from the beginning. This is how God brought up man. Man lost what God gave. God restored it through Jesus. You have new life through Christ. So what he's saying is, sins removed, so live again. By my spirit. <laughs> you get it? The things I do, you'll do if you believe. Why? Because what's in me is in you. <sighs> this stuff is what's wrong with me. 
<laughs> See, I used to not know this stuff. I used to not even believe this stuff. Oh, this is heavy. Watch this, verse 23. I don't ever really hear this taught out, but I went for it a couple years ago because I felt like the Lord gave me a revelation. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. When do you have permission to be in unforgiveness? Huh? And why is he talking about retaining sins? As if it's an option. When is retaining sins an option? Is it? So I wonder why he sounds like he's making it optional. Guess what he's saying? You and I have become the body of Christ, the expression of Him. Flesh expresses what's in it. Christ is the anointing. We're the embodiment of His power that works through love. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, guys, when you go, I go. And if you forgive the sins of any, they'll be forgiven because they'll understand my mercy through the mercy I've given you. They'll understand my love through the love I've given you. But if you harden your heart, if you see men through another eye, if you slide away from this truth, this wisdom, and retain men's sins, how will they know my mercy when you're the body of Christ? Look how the church has turned legalistic in many circles how we've turned very works-oriented, very self-righteous, very judgmental. And men don't see the way out because that hardens their heart even more and they back away and even run. What he's saying is if you lose sight of what saved you and fail to represent the thing that saved you, how will they know the way to me except through you? representing Him. Do you get that? So if I retain and get in unforgiveness, how will they know of the way of mercy if I'm the one that's representing Jesus in my confession? If I'm hard in my heart and I represent God to the world and I say I'm a Christian and I'm representing God and I'm hard in my heart, how will they know the love and mercy of Him? You get it? Because you never have permission to be in unforgiveness and retain sins. It says if you have a complaint against anyone, Even as Christ forgave you, so you forgive. So what's he saying? If you get born again and become love, this whole thing will fly so good. But if you have any self-intention, any self-preservation, any other interest, how will men know? You get it? Do you see why... It's an open playing field and everybody's in need of love. It doesn't matter what they're doing, saying, how they're acting. In fact, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. God's heart groans towards the people that are way out of bounds because He so knows that's not who they're created to be. And His love is trying to win them, turn them, deliver them. If we're not careful, we're thinking, boy, they ought to know better by now. If we aren't saved by now, they ain't never getting saved. Well, they're so willful. They're so arrogant. They're so... And all of a sudden, we're playing God and determining someone's when the harvest field is ripe. It's convicting, but it's true. So let's forgive sins so they're forgiven. Let's never retain sins so that men know the way of mercy. And as He sent As the Father sent Jesus, so He sent us. He went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the enemy. He said, follow me. The things I do, you'll do if you believe. So... Just do it. You you approach people. You start to love them. You do. You're a Nike Christian. Just do it.